looking in the wrong direction. There are a lot of people that are interested in my music. They're interested in who I am as a person. And I just wanted to share with you guys. So these vlogs are going to be called Transparent Progression. So this is vlog number one. I'm going to be looking down and looking at you guys all at the same time. All right, so to get started, uh, I was born in New Brunswick, New Jersey as of February 5th, 1991. I have a morning, baby. Which I was born at 7 o'clock a.m. My being born was probably exciting. It was probably exciting to my parents, but apparently they didn't see a need to keep me. So I was left in the hospital and was taken in by guardianship of my grandmother. Which was awesome. So when I was younger, this is somewhat graphic for a lot of people. But I was molested by men and women. Many of the men or women that my dad had brought into the home when I was visiting him, they were interested in little kids, so I'm not sure. There was one time, I do remember going over to my dad's place and then we went over to my grandfather's place and that was when my uncle Charles uh, had violated me as well. And then that kind of kicked off of me performing sexual acts in kindergarten with other small other kids as well. I remember this one girl, I had an encounter with her and that was the first time that I knew what a private part looked like on a female. So that was interesting. But then there were other times that there was an older brother and then there was a brother, there was a, a a boy that was like around my age and he we were going to the bathroom and then I guess we would do stuff together in the stalls. Another time that I remember was I knew something was very very different with me. I used to be a boy scout and I used to go to these camp meetings. We used to go camping for my sectum and then there was this guy named Garrett and we would share a tent together and then we would do different things and I was just I was terrified I didn't know anything that was going on. I, I felt so ashamed of all of these acts because it was new, totally new to me. My sexual drive started super, super early because I used to, you know, watch my dad have sex with many women, um, even while I was in the same bed. And then they would turn around and they would, you know, mess with me while I was gone, while he was gone. And also when he, you know, left for work, you know, I knew uh, trouble was coming. So, then I went to a private school. The first one was Zarephath, and then the second one was New Life. Now, New Life Christian School was a great school because um, that was kind of where my character and my personality kind of, you know, took off and, and started to form. Um, I met my best friend there. Um, his name was his name is Chris Lilly, which actually you can actually uh, go check out his YouTube channel. Um, he's a musician. He does some sermons and him and his wife also do um, a podcast um, uh, around depression, being married with depression. Um, and so that's really cool. Love Chris Lilly. He's also a kind of person who started, you know, where my voice was because I remember when I was in school, he, he started singing. And I was like, I wanna do that. So he technically has been singing longer than I have. But I, I do remember I started singing The Lord is My Shepherd and I was just amazed. And so I started singing and I've loved singing ever since. And so that's where my music ability came from, you know, and wanting to learn the piano, wanted to learn instruments, wanted to learn all of these things. And we used to throw rocks at cars together in which I got spanked very badly for doing that. I also was super mischievous in private school. I remember I cut this Chinese girl sweater up. My grandmother says it was because I liked her, but I don't believe that it was because I liked her. It was because I just was mischievous and I just got bored of doing things. So um, I remember this one time I got on the wrong bus to go to this guy's, this boy's name, uh, his name is Quincy. And my mom didn't, my grandmother didn't like him. And so I went to his home, got on the bus purposely because I was rebelling and acting out. When she found me, I also then got another spanking. Um, I remember going to one of my grandmother's friend's house. So my grandmother had, uh, she had this friend and they- They would talk for hours and hours. They would pray and talk. 
And meanwhile, they're in the basement. They're they're in the basement. My grandmother's friend's daughter, who was a little bit older than me, and she would like do weird things to me in the basement. So once again, um, there's that being violated and weird stuff. I didn't know what was going on with me. I. I was super confused uh, at an early age. I mean, your mind is still like a sponge in your adolescence. And so um, I would do things like mutilate myself. Um, I stuck myself in my kneecaps with knives, try and see how far it would go. And then it would sting. I would cut my knuckles, apparently, according to my grandmother, but I don't remember doing that. And then I would try sticking sharp knives into my, my stomach. Uh, or little pins to my arms to try and see how far they would go. But that led to a level of acting out. Uh, my sisters who are three sisters who stayed with me, one's actually my cousin, but I consider her as, her as my sister because it was that long of a time that I actually, you know, live with them. But I wanted to be the only one in the house. And I remember my aunt had one of my sisters, she had, uh, well, my, well, really my cousin, but she had her, she came in the house and then my mother had two children, um, my oldest sister, Ashley, and we went to collect her and then we went to go collect Sierra, who's my youngest sister. Well, she's not my youngest sister that I have, but in the house, she was my younger sister. Uh, my oldest sister and then my cousin, who were very close in age, when I was acting out, I would like go and I would push them down the stairs. And this was like a full, it wasn't a double staircase, but it was a full staircase um, inside of the home in New Jersey. And I would just push them down the stairs. And then I would act as though I was sleeping or I would act as though I was, you know, doing something else. My grandmother and my aunt, then they found out and my grandma got extremely angry because I could have broken their necks. And looking back at it now, I don't, I, I hope my children never act out in that way, but I I did seriously act out. I also, my through my acting out, I was stealing from cars early in the morning when my grandmother and my aunt left for work. I would steal out of these, these cars around the neighborhood um, before I went to school. And for punishment, my grandmother would make me for like long periods of time just sit and like read the bible without tv or music and then that's also where my imagination would run wild like i had a, a imaginary best friend and i had you know like i just had a whole bunch of stuff but then that led to more acting out i would throw pillows out the window and i would throw them with a match you know just it, it just weird stuff but i do know that um my grandmother and my aunt they did the best that they could to raise all four of us inside of that home you know my biological dad and i'm gonna call him raymond um because i don't i don't really consider him as my dad but raymond was um in and out of my life during the time we lived in monmouth county i think also in yeah just in monmouth county you know, I ran away from home. And I think that was the peak of my acting out for that particular time period. <clears throat> and so the period of we're talking about is probably from the time of about five years old to about eight years old here, where my dad was in and, inside of, in and out of my life and I was acting out and I was running away. And um, I had to, There, the, the first time I ever ran away, it was just to the end of the road by a domino. And then I started crying and then someone found me and somebody was trying to figure out what, what, what was going on and why I was crying. And then they brought me back to the home and... I was supposed to be raking leaves, so... I don't know. I remember some good things about living in, in um, Howell Township in New Jersey when I was that young. There would be times that my grandmother actually almost every Saturday my grandmother she would take uh, me um, and I guess when the my sisters got a little bit older she would take us to KB Toys in the Howell Mall or Freehold Mall rather um, she would do that almost every Saturday and the one place that we went to was uh, we went to a place called Johnny Rockets which Oh my God, their burgers are so good. They come in the actual, the plastic paper, the white plastic paper, just like the 50s. And it was just amazing. And I would eat the onion rings and um, I actually had onion rings with ranch and that was amazing and it was awesome. But with Christmases though, my grandmother and my aunt did the best that they could. And for the most part, all of my Christmases, they, they, were, they were extremely awesome. I do remember um, there was 
a certain kind of candy that my grandmother would get us from a store. And it was like licorice with, well, mine, it was either strawberry, orange, or, or apple licorice, and it had this cream in it, and it was so good, and I feel like they discontinued it, but whatever. Then it comes to another place where, you know, my grandmother lost her job, and um, uh, eventually, you know, she lost the mortgage, but it was for a good cause. Uh, my grandmother, um, she, you know, she walked off of one of her jobs because of uh, unfair treatment and other things. It was, it was just a lot going on. And then we actually ended up having to move and we moved down to Alabama, which I believe that was more of an opportunity rather than um, just all uprooting. Um, we were uprooted, we felt uprooted, but it was more of, I, I guess, an opportunity. But before we left, uh, there was this church that we were going to, uh, and it was an Assemblies of God. I think it was the, called the First Assembly of God. That was where I met a lot of friends before we left. But there was this white, there was this white guy in there, and it, he was a tall white guy. His name was we called him Mr. Dan, and we found out that Mr. Dan was actually touching my sisters, and that was, it was a weird time because then all I remember was my grandmother saying, "You better not come near them again." We just stopped going to that church. So I, I remember uh, my sisters describing how he tried to kiss them inside of the car because at the time um, we would catch rides with Mr. Dan because I, you know our our car was out of commission. So yeah. Anyway, so we moved down to Alabama, and this was actually a huge pivotal point of my whole entire life. Huge pivotal point. This was where I felt super, super uprooted because I know from learning in, just just in the schools um, that I've been taught back then at that particular period of time, it was just a very bad thing to live in the, the South because you know, when you're taught, when you're young, and you're taught about nothing but like but slavery and um, this is what happened to black people and um, all of the pain and all of that kind of the suffering and all of that. When you're taught that and there was slavery in the South, as a young person, you make up in your mind that you don't want to go there. So as we were going down to Alabama, I, I just felt so devastated that we were going down to this place and I couldn't stay up in New Jersey. So. So when we got down to Alabama, we moved into my cousin's house uh, or our cousin's house who, you know, his her son was in and out and in and out. He always like left at, at interesting times of the day. But I remember my first worship experience in in the house and my grandmother was gone and my si I don't know where my grandmother, I don't know where my sisters were, but they weren't in the room with me. I know that our room that where we stayed um, I put on um, some worship music and I had a opportunity to worship God on my own. It was like, it was like the hardest worship that I've ever had. Like it was super, su it, I had an encounter. And like I was sweating, my heart was beating fast. I ended up on the floor, um, face down. And I just was so, I was, I, I just thought to myself that this, this is what I want to do. I want to do this. Right. So then we started attending a church called uh, Daystar Family Church, where which it was Daystar um, International back then. But, you know, it, it, you know, churches go through name changes. Um, but it was a part of Assemblies of God in Northport, Alabama. And there was only one of them at the time. And I love that church so much. So we started going there and I, I didn't have any involvement in the church at that time. I was going to a school called Collins Riverside Middle School. That was where I was like, I was super confused because um, I started getting into, you know, like my, I wouldn't say maturity, but it was, um, what do you call it when you are, um, your body is changing. Anyway. My body was changing. So I was super confused about what I liked, what I didn't like. And at that particular time, it never changed. It never changed that of me liking girls and boys. It never changed, that whole thing never changed. I do remember um, being called Gay Ray inside of the school and it hurt my feelings so much. And it's so crazy because the person that 
started that was so-called was my best friend Carlos and he started that whole rumor and it's so crazy because you know um, he came out as gay um, you know pro uh, probably I would say not more than four or five years ago but I just think that whole thing is crazy you know to cover up himself you know and whatnot but I've forgiven him since but I just think that whole thing he had the whole school um, calling me this this name and it was you know but also this was where I, I received my sharp tongue from my wittiness um, here because it, it was tough it, it grew to be very tough there was so I did have a couple of bullies um, there was this one boy his name was William and every single time we would have gym or a field day or any particular time of going to gym like he would just punch me in the stomach so hard several times sometimes and I would just I don't know until I started coughing up blood and then I realized I had an ulcer and it was just it was just too much and that was one particular time of bullying we then moved to my great aunt's house for for my grandmother to be a caregiver in the city of Tuscaloosa which was the west end um it was in the west end side of of um where we lived of Tuscaloosa rather and so it was a rough rough kind of neighborhood but um uh, yeah she just wanted to be a caregiver for my my great aunt because you know she couldn't get around too much and so she you know ran errands she would make her food make her bed help her get around the house and, and we would attend older baptist churches sometimes and these were all black churches so i got to learn more of the culture there and received a little bit more of culture and there's nothing wrong with um older black churches the problem comes in is where there, there's a super, super religious um, culture that goes on inside of older black churches. And but that's neither here nor there. We'll get into that in another video and we'll talk about it in another video. But I do remember um, the sound of uh, the older gospel hymns on a radio on Sunday mornings and the smell of sausage and eggs and that would be made on Sunday mornings. And it was just, uh, it was just beautiful. So Sundays in the South are amazing. So uh, I had to sleep on the floor while my sisters slept on a bed because we only, we were confined to just one room. My great aunt, she had two rooms inside of the whole house um, and it was, we, we took up the other room. My great aunt, she was mean most of the time and sweet sometimes, but yeah. Uh, at the same time we were staying there, my grandmother, she was at a jail ministry. Um, she worked also with the jail ministry. So I thought that was pretty cool, which I find out now that I feel that that is where a lot of ministry needs to take place is inside of a jail ministry. Like, I feel like that's amazing. So when I was at Collins, Collins Riverside, that also was another pivotal point in my life because that's also where I started acting out 2.0. I started acting out again. Now, how I was acting out, I was getting into small fights at school. I remember the biggest fight that I ever got into was actually with a girl and she won. Um, and I, I, I left with scratches on my face, scratches on my, my chest, and I, um, my t-shirt was ripped. But I remember her name was Kendra King. And she, she, you know, she beat me up and I was so ashamed. And then I actually was the one who was expelled from school indefinitely, like just expelled. Um, but I guess at that particular time, putting the pieces together, I was probably more of the troublemaker. So that would make sense. But I remember um, Mr. Monroe told, uh, told me and my grandmother that I was expelled from school and I could not come back. And then, and then I went home and I was so, so angry at myself, at the world. I was so angry. I just didn't get my way. So I guess then um, I rose up at my grandmother a few days later and my grandmother, um, she was, you know, going to spank me or something like that. And I caught the bell and I said, no, ma. And she said, okay. Right. And then she went inside the kitchen and she got a, a skillet and she was like, no more what? I remember that. I remember I just wanted to 
I just wanted to leave. I just wanted to have another life. I wanted to have another family. I just wanted to start over. Um, because at that point with my great aunt, I was stealing. Um, I was before we went to church because youth group would have all of these different candies. My, my youth, um, group, they would have all of these different candies and snacks and everything. And I would have to ask, um, this one girl named Chantel, I would have to ask her for money to get some. And I felt just bad. So I ended up feeling worse because I started stealing from my great aunt out of her purse and where she would keep the purse. And then I would, I would steal money out of it, um, to take to church, but it wasn't a give until often. Was snacks, so. Reluctantly, I wasn't a, a heavy set kid. So, but I eat a lot of snacks. I remember going to this camp that was called an internship. We were supposed to be helping, and this was in my preteens or so, but we were supposed to be helping the camp so that when we actually had youth camp, um, all of the kids would come in and, you know, they would just enjoy, but we would have to do things, little things around the camp um, to try and fix it up and build things and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, there was this boy named David Cabill, and he would pick on me so much. And we just got into a huge fight um, like there. He just didn't like me. I didn't like him. And we got into this huge fight. Fast forward on to the actual youth camp. Um, that particular year, the first time of me actually going, it was it was a devastating thing because this was my first encounter with someone who actually died. You know, we had the, we, we had the service that night and we were all in worship and all of this kind of stuff. And we had a super fun super fun time after um the worship but there was this boy who went back into his his dorm back to the 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 cabin um and he he actually uh started choking on skittles and he actually died um at this youth camp and i just thought that was one of the craziest things um and then we actually stayed up all night we actually stayed up all night praying for this kid, you know, and just singing and all of this kind of stuff. And I remember it was the next two days was super, super quiet. It was super quiet throughout the camp. And I never experienced something like that before. You know, someone dying at a camp and someone, it, it was just crazy. But that same youth group, um, it belonged to the, you know, the church. And so I would walk I would walk him out about 20 miles to church because I was just that adamant about being a part of something that at the time it seemed like it was bigger than myself. Just going back to that, that night, you know, it was a heavy, overwhelming spirit that like filled the camp. It was super, super heavy. Anyway. I started being very rebellious, super rebellious toward my own grandmother. Like I would still rise up at her and things like that. But I knew there was much more than an uh, impoverished lifestyle at that point. I didn't know what it was called, but I knew there was more than just th this particular lifestyle that I was living every single day. I started running away again. I remember the farthest I've ever run was from the West End to like the east side of town where the mall was. And that was on a night and I supposedly had ran away from this demon that was chasing chasing me. Like that was that was a big pivotal point in my life because I did not want to be a part of that life anymore. And anything that could have gotten me away from, you know, just away. What as I was running away, I started going to this guy's house um, who found me at a like a gas station one time when I ran away. And he was like 17 or 18 years old. And I started running to his house because he was very welcoming and whatnot. But every time that I would run to his house, you know, he would molest me and touch me and, and all of these kind of things. And like his, his mom was super, super nice, but she knew nothing about this. I remember waiting at this particular guy's house for the most part. I remember waiting at his house until he got home. And there would be times where it would take hours where he wasn't even home yet. Um, and so like the neighbors around started getting suspicious because I was just sitting on the porch and I was this young person. And <clears throat> one time the police were called. That particular, so with that particular time, um, 
just fast forwarding and we'll get back to the other thing. So I ended up in a, a group home after my first foster home. And inside of that group home, um, I started going to therapy. I started going to this counselor and the counselor would just put like words in my mouth and things like that. But it started getting to the brass tacks where she started getting into certain things that I would say, and then she would bring that out a little bit. And what, there was this one time that I started telling her about the, this boy. I mean, I started telling her about this, this guy that I was running away to. And we were started doing stuff and I told her how old I was and I told her how old he was. And she was just appalled at that because we were doing stuff together. And that was my first encounter of knowing that it was not right of what he was doing. And so like she called the authorities and there was this whole thing. There was this whole case about it. He actually went to jail for like three years and then had to be put on the national offend offenders, sexual offenders list. Um, and I just thought that whole thing was crazy because um, we'll get into another uh, thing later on about there was something else that happened in my life um, that was kind of in relation to that. But I just thought that was uh, it was a, just a crazy point in my life. I just wanted to be with another family. I begged to be with another family. And my grandmother, she gave up her rights to the state. So I became a ward of the state. Because they couldn't find my biological mother. My biological dad was, he was not fit to become a parent, parental figure that could take me in at the time. And my grandmother, I just begged her and I was acting out too much and I was doing too much. There was actually this one time that I actually wanted to go to juvenile jail and I actually went. I went to juvenile jail and luckily that has been sealed and all of that kind of stuff. But I went to juvenile jail and I knew that wasn't the place for me, but I begged to go there. So that was interesting. The first foster home that I went into, it was it was horrible. They were putting children in scolding hot water. And, and even if they were disciplining them, that still wasn't okay. They would leave all of us at home while they went out. And there were many times that I actually ran away from there. So that was my first foster home. That was a horrible experience. And then the second foster home that I went to, it was um, around the corner from my grandmother's house. So imagine you're right like three or four houses away from your grandmother's house and you're not supposed to go there, you know, but you know, that's neither here nor there because I begged to go, you know. Um, I was just in search of like the perfect family, right? But I went to Mrs. Washington's house and that was a crazy experience because uh, she was an elder inside of this, one of the older Baptist church, churches where, and uh, she, that, that was just where we attended. Um, but I remember she would make us read the Bible at like 5 a.m. In, in the morning. We would have to get up on time um, and we could not watch TV, play outside, go anywhere or speak loudly in the house. Almost like we had to speak like this inside of the home, like it was really quiet. Anything above this, we would have, you know, gotten, we would just would have been on punishment, which is so crazy because um, I was a good kid there. And I never stepped out of line and I did everything that was asked of me, but I, yet I always wondered what would happen. Even me being a rebellious person, I always wondered what happened if we stepped out of line, what would happen? I never found out. So uh, we would not be able to talk to each other. Inside of this foster home, there was about, there was like three girls around my age. Uh, and so we were all like, between the the ages of 11, 13, 11 and 13. And there were like three girls and there was like two other boys inside of the home. So there was like six of us all together and we were not allowed to talk to each other. We weren't allowed to whisper or anything like that. And it was like certain hours of the day that we could actually get a word in to each other. We would have our own service in the back of the home uh, most days um, where she would you know, conduct the service and we had to play this older piano and uh, that was just a weird experience. Lights out at 7. At 7 p.m. we had to turn all the lights off and we had to get in bed. I remember I 
my grandmother took me back in at some point and I went to go stay at her house and there was this like agreement that I can get in touch with Raymond and go see how he is and go live with him. Um, and I went to go stay with my, with him in New Jersey. There, I remember that was a horrible experience. I was put into the school, which there was nothing wrong with the school, but staying with Raymond, I, I had to stay in the same home with him, my aunt Valerie, and then there were like my, my two cousins, which one is in jail now, and her, her, her boyfriend at the time was shot, uh, uh, Ahmad. And that was a weird experience because there was like, there was like two, two, uh, two rooms that were upstairs inside of the apartment. And me and my cousin stayed in one, my aunt Valerie stayed and my dad stayed downstairs. Anyway, and that's neither here nor there. I did have another bully, a person who bullied me. Um, his name was Isaiah, and he would... Like, on sight, he would just beat the hell out of me, on sight. That was the crazy, that was so crazy. Like, every single time he saw me, every single time. And he would walk like with four or five other guys, and they would just beat me up for no reason, every time. And that happened almost every single day. I'll say every other day to be fair, but that was, I don't know. That was my first encounter with wrestling with guys. And I would put, I would find myself before I went outside, I would put on these, um, these heavy coats, these heavy jackets so that when they actually came up to me, you know, I would just, you know, I would, get into the fetal position and then just take it, you know? And there were certain times that I thought I wouldn't, I, I just wasn't gonna take it anymore and I just decided to fight him and things like that. So I walked with the big stick. I, behold, the big stick did not do anything. But that was, that was one of the biggest bullies that I've ever had. Like every other day being beat up by this person for about 10 minutes. And nobody would do anything about it. I would tell my dad, and he would be like, like, well, just fight back. You know, if anybody hits you, just fight back. And it just wasn't that easy. Like this was against four or five other guys. But every other day, there it was. In that time that I was uh, up there, run away again, because I didn't want to go through that. But I joined a drum line up there but most importantly, I felt like there was something else missing. I was missing my grandmother, I was missing my sisters, I was missing whatever I was supposed to be down in Alabama, and I was in New Jersey. So. Back to Alabama it was. Part one. It gets heavier.